live um, Facebook also on the channel. Okay, hello everybody. Tonight we're going to be finishing our series that we've been doing about overcoming fear. And tonight we're going to look about overcoming fear for our children. Um, that's a big one. And as parents, if, if you're a parent, um, you know, we, we are concerned. We really are concerned about the future of our children. And I think it never goes away from the time they're little infants. You know, we're, we're, we're watching over them. We're seeing what's going on with them until the time, even when they're grown. How many of you have adult children and um, they may not be walking where they should be walking with the Lord. And as parents, we still want to um, be in there. We still sometimes want to control the situation. And I know that, hey, I'm right there. And control is a form of fear because we're wanting to do it our way. We're wanting to fix it and we're not trusting, fully trusting. So today we're going to look at a story of a woman named Jochebed, who was uh, Moses' mom. We all know of Moses, but not everyone knows the name of his mom, which was Jochebed. And and um, the crisis that she lived uh, during the time that she lived was huge. And just as it is today, we face a lot of challenges, and we know there's a lot of challenges that our kids face. So we're going to go ahead and start in Exodus chapter two. Okay. And then I'm going to, I'm going to do a lot of backing up and do some background, uh, to explain some of this, but it starts like this in, uh, Exodus chapter two and a man of the house of Levi went and took as wife, a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, dabbed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds of the river's bank. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. We'll come back to it. In Numbers chapter 26, 59, we get the name of this woman. And it says, the name of Amram's wife was Jochebed, the daughter of Levi, who was born to Levi in Egypt. And to Amram, she bore Aaron and Moses and their sister, Miriam. So this woman is daughter to Levi, who was one of the 12 princes of, of the, the sons of um, Jacob. And, and Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So her dad was one of the original um, forefathers of the Israelite uh, tribes of the tribes of, um, Le of, um, of Israel. And Levi, out of that tribe came the priesthood. So she was raised by a godly man. She was raised knowing the laws of God, knowing how to fear the Lord. So she had that in her. And her husband was also from the tribe of Levi. So again, he also had that fear of the Lord in him. Now, when we go back to the beginning of Exodus in chapter 1, we see that um, the the children of Israel had, with uh, Joseph, under Joseph, they had gone down to Egypt, and, and Pharaoh at that time just rolled out his red carpet for Joseph and said, hey, you know, you guys could have the best of these lands, bring your dad, bring your, your family, and you guys are going to be taken care of here in Egypt. And so while they were there, they grew, and they grew, and they grew, and they multiplied. But the scripture says that a new king arose, that did not know Joseph. So I'm going to go back and in Exodus chapter 1, I'm going to read a little bit about what's going on. It starts um, in verse 6. I'm going to start with verse 6. And Joseph died, all his brothers and all that generation. I want to say something. God always has a voice to every generation. And sometimes we fear um what's going on in the lives of our children or our grandchildren, but God will raise up a voice for that generation. My little granddaughter, um, she just turned six, but from the time she was three years old, her parents split up and she's what I call a ping pong kid. You know, one of these ones that goes back and forth between two homes. And when this first started, it just killed me. It just, you know, tore at my heart because, you know, I grew up like a lot of us, believing that 
a, a child needs to be in one home with mom and dad. And, and I still believe that's true. And I felt really um, broken because of her situation. And then the Lord spoke to my heart and he reminded me, I have a voice for every generation. And what she's going through will prepare her to be a voice for her generation. Because nowadays we see a lot of kids going through this. It's not the best situation, but even there, God can still raise up people and have a voice for that generation. So it says there that Joseph and all the brothers, those original uh, fathers of the faith, they had messed up too, but they came um, to the Lord. Uh, they all died off, and now there's a new generation. And then it says in verse 7, But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. So, you know, God's blessing was on their lives. And that was God's original purpose. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, you know, the Lord, he made man and woman in his image, and he blessed them, and he said, be fruitful and multiply, and they were to be a reflection of God's uh, glory. And so here, now, these Israelites, they're starting to fulfill God's plan and purpose. They're growing. They're multiplying. They're getting strong. They're becoming mighty. That was God's plan. But how many of you know that when God's doing something good, Satan raises his ugly head? And he wants to bring destruction to the children of the godly. We are the godly. And he wants to stomp out that next generation. He wants no voice for God. He wants to destroy our children and our grandchildren because he does not want the seed of the righteous to, uh, to be evident on this earth. And then, so then in verse 8, it says, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And it happened in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us and so go up out of the land. So it says there that they put taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they were the ones that built all of Pharaoh's pyramids and everything else. But you know, even though they were afflicted, they continued to grow and grow and grow. Um, that affliction didn't weaken them. It strengthened them. And sometimes when we're going through things and we're being afflicted, we need to know that affliction can cause us to be strengthened and it can cause us to grow. But but Pharaoh made their lives bitter. But they kept growing. And Pharaoh's like, you know, we got to get rid of these guys, especially the guys. I want you to know, men, Satan has uh, 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 some plans against men, especially because he knows that God created them to be the warriors. God created them to be heads of the home, heads of the church, heads of society. And so if if Satan wants to take somebody out, he wants to take out the man. Imagine, I'm not a bowler, but I've gone bowling before. You know, when you go bowling, there's a, the, the 10 pins are up and it's kind of like this. Well, when you're wanting to make a strike, where do you aim? Where do you aim? You aim at the head pin because if you can knock down the head pin, you know, chances are you can make a strike and knock down a lot of the other uh, pins. Well, God has appointed the man to be the head pin of the family, of the church, of, of society. So Satan aims for the man. And in this case, Pharaoh was saying, you know what? We got to take them out, especially the men. We're not going to wait till these guys grow up and be strong and become a mighty army and conquer us. You know what? Let's take them out while they're young. Let's take them out while they're defenseless. Let's take them out while they're babies. And Pharaoh devised a plan to kill especially the baby boys. We see that in our nation, even through abortion. You know, Satan's going even further, and he's saying, let's take them out in the womb. We're not going to wait till even they're born. Let's take them out in the womb. So Pharaoh says to the midwives, the women that help give birth, he says, you know what? When you go over there and you see a baby born, baby boy born, kill it. 
but let the little girls live. And these women feared God, and, and they refused to do it. They refused to listen to what uh, Pharaoh said, and they saved the children. Anyways, Pharaoh says, okay, then next plan, plan B. And he, to he tells all the people of Egypt, when you see a baby, we're going to throw him into the Nile River. And that Nile River was full of crocodiles. And, and he had no mercy at all. Can you imagine taking innocent little babies and throwing them into the river filled with crocodiles? That's like no mercy at all. Well, Satan has no mercy at all. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about your children. He doesn't care about your grandchildren. And so we have to be proactive to overcome those fears of their future and act in faith. So this is the time that Jochebed is born into. She's been raised as the daughter of a Levite. She has faith. She knows God's truth. But now she, um, she has two other children. Aaron and Miriam are also her children. This woman had to have done something right because she ended up raising three children that feared the Lord and followed God and made a difference for their nation and, and for the world. So she, they have this baby. And in Hebrews 11, it talks about uh, both of the parents that, that they feared the Lord and they hid him. And they feared God more than the laws of man. So she has this baby. And, um, you know, babies cry. Moses cried just like any other baby. He, they cry and they, they keep him hidden. But can you imagine? I mean, this mom, if you're pregnant, it's going to be hard to, to hide that pregnancy. And, you know, she probably had to go out, get water, food. They were slaves and all of these things. And... It would probably be pretty hard to continue hiding a pregnancy till your ninth month. And then once she had that baby, she was trying to hide him. You know, she and babies, they cry. Um, and she was probably trying to keep him quiet all the time. But it got to the point where she couldn't hide him anymore. She couldn't protect him anymore. And, and in our own lives with our kids, there comes a point that we can't protect them anymore. We have to do something different. We have to trust God for their lives, especially if there are adults. How many of you guys have adult children? Okay, I have adult children, we have adult children. And when we see them doing wrong, I don't know about the men, but I know us women, we are control freaks, which is a form of fear. And we, yeah. we wanna control our 30, 40, 50 year old kids. We want to control them. We want to tell them what to do. We want to tell them what not to do. We see that them going maybe in a wrong path and we want to um, give them advice, which a lot of times they don't want to hear. So, yes. right? Amen? Amen? Yes. Amen. And, and, um, and, and I learned, I am learning in the present that it doesn't work. When we try to control our kids, um, it just causes them, especially if they're adults, it causes them to just shut down, back off. You know, uh, they, they are their adults. They don't want our advice. They don't need our advice. They're going to do it their way. And it forces us to a point where we have to release them and let them go. And that's what happened with Jacobin. If she had kept baby Moses at home, he was going to for sure be killed because she wasn't going to be able to keep him quiet. When that little boy grew, and he was maybe a year, a year and a half, two years, if you've had a two-year-old boy running around your house, you know you can't keep a two-year-old little boy still. They're into everything, and, and, and that would have been a disaster. So she had to make a decision. What was she going to do with her child? I don't think that she just you know, just went and put him in the river. I think she spent a lot of time praying. He was like three months old at this point, And she probably, even before she gave birth to him, she was probably praying and praying and praying over that child. And, and even during those three months, I'm sure, I'm sure the woman of faith that she was, she was praying for her son. And she knew that she was powerless but that God was powerful and she was asking God. Now the scripture doesn't say this, but it can be assumed just because 
of the outcome of Moses' life. You know, Lord, what, what do I do? What do I do? And she, she decided to follow God. God always gives us a plan of action because, see, faith, if there's no action behind it, it's really not faith at all. So she builds this little, like a little basket thing, and she, she lines it, you know. I mean, they're poor. They're slaves. She lines it with, like, a tar, like a little bit, some, something that would make it waterproof. And then she took it to the river, and she had to release her baby to the Lord. Now, she didn't let it float down the river. She put it in the reeds, kind of on the edges, where it wasn't actually in the river. But she left it there, and, um, and, but she was watching. And, the, and Moses' sister, Miriam, she was maybe eight or nine years old. I don't know exactly, but she was there watching. It says in chapter 2, verse 4, And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So now it's a good time for um, Moses to cry. James Vernon McGee says that God went and gave him a little pinch at just the right moment, and he started to cry. And, and her heart was melted with compassion. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. Okay, I think I read that already. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. So God has a way of taking care of our kids. But it wasn't without some kind of action on her part. She trusted the Lord. She prayed. She acted in faith. Then she released him into the hands of the Lord, and she was forced to trust God to be the one that would take care of him. And, and I mean, I know personally, I've gone through things with my kids, and it's, uh, it's I, I think you'd rather suffer things yourself than to see your kids suffer. But we have to remember one thing, that God loves them more than we do. And the scripture says in Ephesians chapter 1 that he chose us before the foundation of the world to be his. He chose our kids before the foundation of the world to be his. And in Philippians 1, 6, it says, he that began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. What God starts in those kids, no matter how old they are, he will finish that job. And so she releases him there, trusting in the Lord, and, and the sister's there watching. She kind of maybe kind of hides back. She, she uh, the sis, little sister's watching. Um, and then, verse 7, 2, 7, Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, um, that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said, hold on, let me turn my page here, to her, go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Can you believe that? Here, this woman releases her child to God's hands and to his care. And, and then, you know, they didn't have bottles or formula. Then, you know, the mothers would nurse their babies from their own bodies. And the, the young sister goes, should I go call a nurse lady? You know, somebody that can nurse this child. And she said, yes, go call her. And so who does she call? She calls Jochebed. Her, Moses' own mother is going to be the one that Pharaoh's daughter gives um, Moses to her to raise. When we release to God, God gives right back to us. And then, look at this, in verse um, 9, Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse her for me, and I will give you your wages. So not only does Jochebed get baby Moses back in her care. She gets paid to take care of her own child. She gets paid to, to nurse her baby. Isn't that just like God? God can turn things around and, and, and just bless us more than what we would expect. Uh, so the woman took the child and nursed him. And then verse 10, and the child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. So she called his name Moses saying, because I drew him out of the water. So 
So Jacobet gets her baby back and she's able to raise him. She's able to, I'm sure she took advantage during that time. And I'm sure she was teaching him the word of God, the language of the Hebrews, the faith of, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But there came a time when he was older and we don't know how old, but she again had to release him over to Pharaoh's daughter so that he could be raised by her in the palace. And, and Moses ended up having both best of both worlds. As she released him back to Pharaoh's daughter, he was educated with the best education in the world at that time. The best education was in Egypt and it was the best one in the world. And he got that training and, and everything that he would need later to become a deliverer. Now, let me ask you, do you think that Jacobin was afraid when she released her son um, and put him in that little basket? I know as a mom, I would be petrified to, yeah, to leave sure. your, your three-month-old baby and, and, and leave him in the reeds or turn him over to someone. She had to be petrified. But fear is, it's, acting in faith is not always the absence of fear, but it is taking action even though there may be fear. I'm sure she probably had some fear. And she probably was, as a mom, I know I would be weeping as I released my child, but, but she had to come to that place of trusting the Lord with all of her heart. And in the end, God brought her son right back to her where she could finish giving him the training uh, and the, the faith handed down to him. And later, that faith that she implanted it in him would sustain him because we, we know that he grew up and he was a deliverer and God used him greatly, but it was the faith of his mama. It was the faith of his mama. And if what would have happened if she had said, no, Lord, I, I can't release him to you. No, Lord, I can't take that step of faith. Well, Moses probably would have died and been thrown in that Nile River. Um, she may have been killed herself. The nation of Israel would not have had the great deliverer, Moses, that we know in the Bible. But see, we see Moses and we see this great man of God, but we don't see that there was a mama behind the scenes that was putting her faith and trust in a, in a, in a God that can be depended on. And she stood on the promises of God. Because see, way back in Genesis chapter 12, when God had started the formation of a nation, he called Abraham and he said, I will bless those who bless you and I will make you a nation, even though he had no kids. And then in Genesis chapter 15, you know, Moses is, uh, uh, Abraham is talking to the Lord and he says, look, you know, you haven't given me any kids. How am I going to become a nation? And he's saying, look at my circumstances. And God says, come here, come here, come here, Abraham. Let's go outside. Let's take a walk outside. You're looking at your circumstances right now. Your son, your daughter may be addicted to drugs. They may be in, in, in prison. They may be out in the world. They may be doing their thing. And sometimes we look at the present circumstances. Look how long they've been away from God. Look, they've turned God to, away from God. They're all into materialism. They, have, they don't want anything to do with God. But like what he said with, with Abraham, he says, let's take a walk. Instead of looking at your circumstances, look up. Look at the stars. Can you count them? Because if you can count them, that's how many children and descendants I'm going to give you. They're going to be more than the stars of the sky. And, and the scripture says that Abraham believed God and it was counted onto him for righteousness. I don't know where your kids are. You know, uh, of four children right now, there's only one that is actively serving God in my own life. And sometimes it becomes discouraging. You know, you say, Lord, I serve you with all of my heart. Lord, I'm in church every Sunday. Lord, you know, I, I've been faithful to you all these years. And look, look at where my kids are. But the word of God teaches us not to look at our circumstances, but to look to God and look at what he is going to do. He had told Abraham, 
The children of Israel are going to go into a foreign land. They're going to be slaves for 400 years. But I'm going to deliver them. And did God do that? He absolutely did. God can work in our lives even beyond our lifetime. We don't even need to be alive to see the promises of God. Because when God says something, he is not a man that he should lie. And what he says, he will fulfill. So, whatever your situation is, you know, we take those steps of faith. We're obedient to the Lord. But we trust God with what we can no longer do. We cover those children, grandchildren, with prayers. And we trust that God will will do it because that's his promise and our children are our inheritance from the lord sometimes we got to fight uh the enemy i've got a little pit bull you guys probably saw him earlier and i've always been petrified of pit bulls and then my daughter got a pit bull of all dogs and and <laughs> so when i come to san diego i'm here half the week guess who i am wrestling i am wrestling a pit bull and that dog um she's ferocious she's still sort of a puppy but she's a strong ferocious puppy but i've learned that i can wrestle tennis shoes out of her mouth and it's like uh uh little doggy i'm going to win and she's she's really strong but but i said you know lord i'm overcoming my fear of pit bulls and if i can rescue a tennis shoe from her mouth then the <laughs> enemy is not gonna he's not gonna take my children <laughs> or my grandchildren because if i can if i can if, if if my daughter's tennis shoe which they left on the floor is is valuable enough for me to wrestle a pet pit bull for uh, for it i'm gonna wrestle Satan, the enemy of our soul for our children. They're our children. They're our inheritance. And they are the future generation that God will use. So God bless you all. And um, hope you enjoyed that study. Okay. <laughs>